briefing is that uh, we felt that it is important for the media to be on the same page with us in terms of understanding where we are and where we are going. Uh, many times we uh, discuss issues without having a full understanding of the issues at hand. And so part of what we want to do today is to do a presentation to you so that you fully understand uh, the issues surrounding uh, LEC uh, supply of electricity, the challenges we face, and where we are going. One thing I want you to get at the end of this uh, presentation is that we clearly understand where we are, and we have a clear roadmap to where we want to be and where we are going. So we are not in the dark uh, and confused and don't know what we are doing. And so hopefully at the end of this presentation, you will have a better understanding of that. But first, I want to go through uh, some very fundamentals so that when we discuss the issues at hand, we are talking at the same level. That means you have a clear and fair understanding of uh, the issues here. So let me start first by telling you that uh, what I'm going to present to you uh, has been validated. And it's been validated by Professor Sebastian Sterl, who is, when you talk about a guru when it comes to hydropower in Africa, is Professor Sebastian Sterl. He was at a round table recently, just July 9th of uh, 2023, at a conference in Kampala, and I was there as well. And he did a presentation. And I think it's important for us to all learn from uh, this expert uh, what he did in his presentation. So I have a few slides that I pulled from his presentation that I would like to go over so that we get a, a basic understanding of uh, hydropower. So this is the very first slide I want us to look at. Uh, at the very bottom, you will see rainfall June to September in centimeters and rainfall from January to March. Now they're shaded. If you look at the very the darkest of the shades, you will see above 80 centimeters. And from January to March, you have above 60 centimeters. That way you have the highest rainfall. And that with the highest rainfall, you have the highest hydro potential. So basically what he has said is that there is an influence of the climate, of the weather, between the monsoon and what he called the the intertropical convergence zone. So when you have the hamatan, you know we have certain time of the year we experience the hamatan. When we experience the hamatan and the monsoon, you will see that from June to September, you have the highest rainfall in central and part of West Africa. So you see the darkest shade there? That's the Liberia zone. So from June to September, we experience over 80 centimeter of rainfall. That's when we have the highest potential of rainfall in Liberia and the highest potential of hydro. When you go to the next uh, uh, picture, you will see that from January to March, it changes. The climate changes where you have the highest rainfall now going down towards the south and eastern part of Africa. So you have the highest rainfall then uh, down and you have the lowest rainfall 10 to 20 centimeters in West Africa, as you can see up there. So what this picture basically tells you is that the rainfall that impacts hydro potential in Africa is affected by weather conditions. It's not by us, it's not by the technology we put there, but it's purely by the climate that none of us have a control over. So the next slide from uh, Professor Sterl talks about the impact of the weather. And you can see that in the middle where we have the West African power pool, Rana River is what we have. You have the lowest capacity is Rana River. The highest is seasonal storage, which means when it rain, what do you do all that rain? The over 80 centimeters. The best option in West Africa is to store it is to have a reservoir where you, you store that water. So when the dry season comes, you can release it into the river and increase the inflow. All right? So 
The seasonality is very important and it has a direct impact on hydropower plant. Now, this is generation profile. What's happening in other countries? So the very first one you see is Mount Coffee. You see how our generation starts in January, very low, February, March, April, then it starts going up in May, and you see June we're up, and the highest peak is August, September, October. And then November we start coming down to December we low. So you see that, you experience that here. In a dry season, which is now, you, you can tell exactly when Mount Coffee will be able to increase its production. You have Madagascar. Also, you have very high uh, 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 production at the top there from January, February, March. Then it drops down when we are having the, the, the high rainfall. And so you see that it, it, the profile changes based on the weather and where you are located. So geography and climate directly impacts that. Now, what is his conclusions? He says that many hydropower plants in Africa have pronounced seasonal production profile. Means that your production of energy is based on the season that you're in. That's what impacts it. It's all over Africa. The second point he makes is that superimposed on that seasonality, hydropower plants with storage would deliver flexibility to support, and that's variable renewable energy integration. In the simple English, what he's trying to say is that if you mix your renewable energy, you can get more. So what do we do? In the, in the dry season where my coffee is very low, what is the highest potential for energy? It's solar. Right? So you see, mix solar with hydro. In the rainy season, you have your hydro at its full potential. In the dry season, solar is in its high potential. So if you mix the two, one can try to make up for the other when one is down. Okay? And that's the kind of advice he gives when he says, uh, if we tend to, when solar is high and vice versa. So, now, let's look at Liberia. He, he looks at Liberia and he shows where, where do we have the uh, solar potential, I mean the hydro. This is the simple river here. You see, one, two, three, four. The St. John River, one. The border with Ivory Coast, one, and the border with Sierra Leone, one. Of course, these two areas, you cannot develop them without agreement with the neighboring countries because those are your boundaries. Our highest potential is St. River. Then next is the St. John, with one side. So a lot of people think that uh, we just wasting time on St. Paul River. Why don't you go to other river, the water flowing? But this is based on engineering studies. It, we at LEC didn't just get up one day and say, oh, we're going to put it here, oh, we're going to put it there. No, there, there, there were a lot of studies that were done and we've been told that this is where you want to do. So we talk about storage. This beer is supposed to be a storage where we store the water. We build a big storage. And when it rains, we fill it up and we close it. Throughout the year, we release the water. We release it. And that's what other countries are doing. And the point is, you build more dams along the same wall. So the same water that I'm leaving from here, that supply this hydro, will supply this one, and will supply this. So you see, using the same water, to supply several hydros as it goes through, okay? So the point here is that the, the, the choice of where you're putting the hydro is not an arbitrary decision that was just made, okay? It's based on engineering studies. And this section shows you the, 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 the seasonal complementarity again. You see here, you got from July, to November is where you're getting your high production because of the rainfall. And then when you talk about solar PV, you also see the highest is January, February, March, April. And then November, December. So in the rainy season, it's lower. It's at 16 uh, and 15%. All right? So when you join these two and create the complementarity, you can make up for the dry season, all right? Climate change. 
He said in his study that the West African power pool, where we fall under, will have a significant impact on climate change. It's one of those areas that most likely will be affected by climate change. So that's why we need to diversify our profile, what we use. You cannot depend on only one uh, source of energy. Now, what is LEC current profile? What does it look like? At the top, you have your generators that use heavy fuel or HFO. LEC has 28 megawatts available for those generators. Look at the cost to run them between 26 cents and 28 cents per kilowatt hour. And you all know the tariff, right? You're paying between, if you social tariff, at 15 cents. If you large business, commercial customer, you pay 22 cents. And if you re normal residential, you pay 24 cents. So basically running the generators mean that we'll be selling the electricity to you for cheaper than what it's costing us to produce it. So it has a major constraint, and that is it's very expensive. And why, why that expense came about? We know the cost of fuel doubled since the Ukraine war. Today now we over $5 a gallon. So that's why when people say today we feel it more when we run our generator, it's because you are paying twice as much for fuel as you were paying before. And so that's the constraint with generators. It's dependent on fuel that is very volatile in the price. The price keeps going up. The second source of power that LEC has is Mount Coffee, our hydropower, which is 88 megawatts. And that costs us 6 cents a kilowatt hour. But the problem is, it's seasonal. We can produce it in the rainy season, but in the dry season, we have a challenge. All right? And I think, as we've already talked, one way to start addressing the hydropower challenge is to add integrated with solar. The last one is CLSG. CLSG is giving us 25 to 50 megawatts at a cost of 14 cents. What is the constraint? The constraint is the supply is limited. Right now, we still can't get 50 from them. They're limiting us to around 32 megawatts. And the second thing is, you are buying this electricity from somebody, so you have to have the cash to pay for it. And now you say you put on my coffee. Well, I reckon supply, you got to pay for that electricity. Okay? So it's, it's a cash-based thing. The supply, you pay for it. So that's a constraint. We don't have, if CLSU could give us all the electricity we need, we wouldn't have a major problem. But they cannot. There's a limit to what they have to sell to us. Okay? Now, what is our plan? Where do we want to go? So the first thing we want to do is we want to harness the power of the simple rule. That simple rule, we want to get the maximum out of it. Which has a potential of 600 megawatts if you put all of the dams along the simple road. So what is our strategy? So we develop cascade hydropower dams along the simple road. Several of them we will put. And we will complement them by having a reservoir at the very top. We need to build a reservoir so we can store all this water that we're getting in the rainy season that's wasted. And lastly, we want to integrate what we have is with solar energy. And that's why we are doing a 20 megawatt solar plant right now. We're going to start doing at Mount Coffee to begin that process. So you can see the benefits. We will be going to renewable power. Everywhere in the world, we are going, because of the impact of climate change, we are reducing our carbon footprint. We want to go renewable and we want to go cheaper. Because renewable energy is much cheaper than having to use fossil fuel based energy. So we know where we are going. We have a clear plan, all right? Now, in 2014, a company called Fickner, which is a consultancy company, they were hired by the World Bank to do a plan for Liberia, which we call the Least Cost Power Development Plan. And this is what they said to us. In the long term, Liberia's power system will be dominated by hydropower, as it will be the least cost option. The least cost. 
Due to the long development periods, it is important to prepare now the basis for the most suitable hydropower expansion. Therefore, relevant studies, especially for hydropower plant options at Singapore and St. John must be prepared in the coming one to two years. We have to start planning. Then they said, the system will be highly dependent on HFO, that few fire power plants in the next 10 years. These are flexible and allow fast expansion. However, see the, the notice again, there is a significant cost risk due to fuel price fluctuations, and we have already experienced it. The price of fuel has doubled, okay, since this report. So, again, it's a scientific study that telling us the option we need to be thinking about going is hydropower. This just the phases, I can I'll jump over this, but it, it, we have a clear idea of what they have recommended that we do. Now, what we are doing right now, LEC, we are expanding Mount Coffee. So Mount Coffee is 88. We're adding two more turbines. So we're adding 50% more capacity to Mount Coffee. Then we are supplementing that with 20 megawatt solar power plant. This project is financed by the World Bank at a cost of $96 million. That money is already approved. The financing agreement was signed. The legislature ratified it. And right now, we are doing the procurement. We have put out the advertisement. Companies have bid up for it. And there's an evaluation going on for this. So this project is on its way. The solar part of it, we expect in one and a half year, it will be ready. The Expansion of Mount Coffee, that will take us about three years because it's a very big project. The second phase is the new hydropower plant, but what we call SP2, Simpor 2. That will be 150 megawatts. The feasibility studies will be ready in March, this March. Okay? We already do an environmental and social impact assessment, it's under preparation. It's a cost, it will cost $550 million to do that project. We already have received $300 million commitment from the World Bank for this project. This year, we'll be meeting with other donor partners to see how we can raise the balance $250 million so that this project can begin. The last phase is to add additional hydro, which is support three, Simple 4 and the reservoir. That reservoir way up at VL. We've done an initial reconnaissance study and we've completed that. Now, this is a picture of the expansion plan for Mount Coffee. Right now, this is our powerhouse with the turbines in them. This is the proposed new section, which will add two more. This is an overview of, this is the powerhouse, this is where the water comes in, it goes down, it turns the turbines, and it goes out, and from there it goes back to the simple room. So the plan is already in place, and we're going for procurement very soon to get a contractor to start this work. This work will provide jobs over a three, year, three to four year period for a lot of people at Mount Coffee. All right, and it will bring a whole lot of new development to what we are doing. The simple cascade, the idea of telling you putting several hydros. If one of the studies were done way back in 1980 and suggested to the government, say, build all you see where the blue water, that's where we're supposed to build the hydros. Right? So, this is Mount Coffee right now. We're expanding Mount Coffee. We can do some more smaller hydro. This is the next one we're going to do, SP2. Then the big one is the reservoir here in SP4. Now, this reservoir, when it rains, we're going to close this place so that the water doesn't flow. It stays there. In the dry season, we then regulate the flow of the water to come down and feed the rest of the hydro plants that are here. Now, this and these, there are major challenges you have to deal with. 
One of the major challenge, this VR, somebody will ask, why would not build a VR already? Well, the problem is this VR is going to cost close to a billion dollars. Secondly, you can't build a billion dollar reservoir only for my coffee. For it to make business sense, you have to have additional hydro. Then this investment makes sense. Now, there's also the environmental concern. Because when you build a reservoir where you're going to store water, you're going to impact all the communities that live around there. So you have a resettlement issue you have to address. There are people that earn their livelihood in those areas that the reservoir is going to flood into. You have to find alternative livelihood for them. Then you have the biodiversity issue, the different species of animals. And then we have whether they are primary, secondary forests. So basically, you have to have a plan to mitigate the risk to the environmental and social issues there. And that costs money. So it takes time. And organizations like the World Bank, African Development Bank, EU, will not fund a project unless you address the environmental impact. If you don't address it, you're not going to get the money to do it. So this takes time, and we are working on this, but we know where we are going. We are going this direction. And we are implementing, so we're expanding here already. We are already got commitment on this. And once we finish this, we, we're working on uh, VIA as well. So, so we have an idea. So what, there are some common misperceptions out there that I want to just address. The first one is that if we change the position of the dam, it will solve the low water inflow problem. If you take my coffee and put it into one other river, it's not going to get you 12 months water supply. The solution, from we heard from the experts, because it's seasonal, you have to store water and release it. So in the dry, in the rainy season, when you got all that water, you got to keep some. So that in the dry season, you use it. That's how Akosomo is built in Ghana. You have a reservoir. You save the water and you release it. So that idea, some people say that, oh, you don't know what you're doing. You all keep putting the thing on the scene. The same problem every year, every year. It is the nature of the topography, the geography, and the climate. So it's not, you can't change it by moving the dam from one place to the other. And sometimes you, you might have a little better uh, position somewhere else, but you might have an environmental constraint that you will, not, you will not be allowed to move in there. But it doesn't solve the problem. The second issue is that we hear that, oh, CLSG can meet all our energy demand. No, they cannot. I've shown you. There's a limit to what CLSG can give us. We're in the rainy season now. You know how much we're getting from CLSG? 60% of what we're giving of the power that we're supplying, 60% come from Ivory Coast. The other 40% is coming from LEC between our generators and what we can get out of my coffee. So they can't even give us 100%. The third misconception, oh, LEC making plenty of money. Well, the first thing is, 30% of the revenue we're making is being lost to power plant. People don't pay, they steal. Secondly, some of our largest consumers have not paid their bills. Don't ask me who they are. I'm sure you can guess. <laughs> and then, they, we have a large percentage of single-face customers that we give them a social tariff, which is 15 cents. Those are people who use very small amount of electricity. But we are subsidizing them. So those people, the energy we account for, we're supplying it to them at 15 cents. And then the last one, people say, oh, but you're not connecting us. No, you're not, LEC not going. We have collected 270,000 customers so far. And before the war, LEC had 35,000. So tell me, we're having trouble. And you look at, before the war, where, there were no communities. The other day, I went, we connected New Jerusalem, New Israel, Zion Town. I was shocked. I didn't even know they had those kind of communities. That's, the, 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 the place have expanded. They said that were all bushed before the war. There are densely populated communities that didn't exist before. 
So we're not really trying to do what we had before the war, but now we have, we have a challenge of way much more than that. All right? And then, of course, there are new areas. Some areas to connect. You don't have the light pole, you don't have the wire, you don't have the transformer. You have to build the network, you have to expand it. In order to do that, you have to have the money to do the expansion. And most of the time, that money has to come from the government. The government is the one that invests in it. Right now, all of the investment in the great expansion comes from donors. But if the donor does not provide it, what do you do? LEC started a program called the Gap Community. What we do is the area that we can try to use some of our own resources to expand to. We do that, and that's why we did the banjo, the iron, iron, uh, what do they call it? Iron, iron gate, yeah, and iron, factory. iron factory, and all these new communities we are doing right now. Okay, we're doing it on our own, but we could do a lot more if the money was in the budget to do it. But it's not there. So LEC, the very money that people pay for the electricity away is what we are using when you recharge. That money we're taking it to buy a light bulb, to buy a wire, to buy a transformer, to buy fuel for the vehicles, to buy meters, to be able to connect more and more communities. Okay? So we are doing the best we can with the limited resources that we have. But LEC, at the end of the day, knows where it is, knows what the challenges are, and we know where we are going. 